president and dean at Albany Law School. So I have the privilege of also saying welcome to Albany Law School um, and welcome in particular to the ninth annual and my first, so it's very special for me, Catherine D. Katz Memorial Lecture. I'm very honored to be here this evening and to have the chance to welcome you to be part of this very important event. The Katz Lecture Series is one of the law school's most significant programs and really greatest traditions. And as I learned more about the Katz Lecture Series, I was really thrilled to discover that we have a long-standing series in our campus that is dedicated to building awareness of important questions of social justice, including topics ranging from domestic violence, gender in the law, children in the law, reproductive rights, and inequality. The range of topics that we have explored through the Katz Lecture Series includes a growing list of really pressing family law topics. And I feel like it really puts us on the edge of thinking about family law, what's going on, where it's going, what we should be focusing on. Um, the series is a really powerful reflection of Albany Law School's commitment to advance equity and social change in our world. And moreover, when I learned that our honoree and keynote speaker would be Professor Jane Spinak, I was thrilled. Professor Spinak is the Edward Ross Arano Clinical Professor of Law Emerita at Columbia Law School. And as many of you here in the room and online know, she's a nationally renowned scholar, award-winning teacher and author. Yeah. Professor Spinak, we are very honored to have you here tonight to deliver the CATS lecture. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about your ongoing efforts to achieve transformative change, which I know you've been working on throughout your entire career. And I'm particularly interested in to hear more about your book, The End of Family Court, how abolishing the court brings justice to children and families. Now, before turning the floor over to Professor Melissa Brieger, who of course is the heart and soul of this, I wanna take just a moment to talk about our friend, Katherine Katz, or as I understand, Kathy to her friends and colleagues. Although I did not have the privilege to get to know Kathy personally, I do know she left a very powerful legacy as a faculty member and a very passionate advocate. From what I understand, Kathy was a cornerstone of the Albany law community from everything I've heard, and it's been a lot. Kathy is and was an absolute favorite among our students, the faculty, and so many beyond the walls. Kathy really did create change based on her tenacity, her smarts, and her powerful voice, and I've loved hearing about her from you personally. Honoring Kathy's legacy, this lecture series, again, has brought light to some of our most pressing social justice issues that we talked about, Re reproductive rights, race, LGBTQ activism, femicide, oppression, and discrimination. And now tonight, of course, the attention will be focused on an area where a lot of attention needs to be focused, juvenile rights and family court. Our distinguished speakers over the year have been the same kind of change makers that Kathy was. Some come from our own outstanding faculty, including professors Melissa Brieger, Mary Lynch, and Stephen Clark. The list also includes our former professor and now Dean Donna Young. All of these folks have brought their teaching and expertise to build awareness in the local and national community. We've also welcomed powerhouses in the field, including not only Professor Spinak tonight, but Dean uh, Kimberly Mutcherson, um, excuse me, Professor Kristen Henning, and Dean uh, Rachel Ray Boucher. Now tonight, we do get to add to that impressive list. So finally, this event is really only possible and really meaningful because of the financial, but also just overall support of one of our school's greatest friends, uh, Miss Betsy Katz, who's right here in the front row and the entire Katz family. So Betsy, thank you. We're thrilled that we get to take a moment each year to remember your, your mom and the impact she made in our community and world. And I am personally so excited to be here to get the chance to know you, to learn more about her and to celebrate her. So I wanna thank you for all of your amazing support and your passion for Albany Law School. I look forward to continuing to build that connection with you over the years and hearing more about your mom as well. So thank you for all you do for Albany Law School. And finally, thank you to everyone here in the room and everyone on Zoom for taking the time out of your day to be here tonight to participate in this really fantastic and important program. It's exactly the type of event that I find great hope in as it brings us together and really encourages us to think critically about pathways to justice. So once again, it's an honor to be here tonight. And now I get to give the floor to, again, our other star, Professor Melissa Breaker. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dean. Um, I would like to echo your welcome to each and every one in the audience today. 
Um, one of the silver linings of this awful COVID pandemic is the ability to have these wonderful hybrid conferences that really will allow us to attract more people. So we had 135. I don't know how if we are reached that, but there's at least 44 on Zoom at the moment. So there's a lot in the room, folks on Zoom, and um, folks from DC, folks from Minnesota. Um, we're supposed to have someone coming in from Mexico, we'll see. <laughs> we also have folks who drove here um, as far as Boston. Uh, we, th we think we're gonna have a couple other visitors as well. So it really is great to have both people in the room and people on Zoom. And during these troubling times in our world, it feels even more important to come together to learn about how we can make society a better place, a fairer place, an unbiased place. So thank you all for joining us. I'm honored to tell you just a little bit more about the legacy of Professor Katz. Professor Katz was only the second female law professor at Albany Law School. Among many of her crowning achievements, she developed the very first domestic violence seminar in the United States in 1986. And Grazia, who was a student here, found that little nugget of information that inspired Mary and I to, um, to write an article about it. Um, she was beloved for her dedication to helping others, especially law students. She was respected for her important scholarship. She was admired for her innovative teaching. She also served as a mentor for so many law professors, myself included, and she has been sorely missed by all. But in addition to being a scholar, a teacher, a mentor, and a leader in the field, she was first and foremost a proud mom and grandma. Betsy is here with us today. Uh, Michael, her son, and his children um, out in California all have adored their mom and grandma beyond words. And it is for that reason that they started this lecture series in 2014. And we're so grateful for their generosity and inspiration that have made tonight possible. So I wanna thank you again, formally. Um, there's also folks in the room I think they're in the room, um, who have really made today possible. Jeff Sieber, my partner in crime, Tom Torello, uh, everyone in the IA department. Um, special thanks to our wonderful law students from the Family Law Society and Women's Law Caucus, Brianna Wagner, Anna Bredeger, Katie Pedlow, who have been really helpful from start to finish. I also want to thank our selection committee which is compro comprised of some great faculty, some great alums and our very own Persia, who I see in the audience today. Um, so we have a lot of people to thank that brought Made Today possible. Today is our ninth lecture of the annual series. The first one was 2015. If Kathy were with us today, and I truly feel that she is in spirit, she would be troubled by the threat of poor families being caught in a system that can be overly punishing. She would be concerned about the impact on mothers, on children, on families. And I think she would have wanted to delve into the potential solutions that Professor Spinek will be presenting today. In fact, I think they would have been fast friends. I do. When I first inquired of Betsy, uh, what do you hope to achieve by setting, commencing this lecture series? She said without hesitation, I just wanted my mother's name to live on forever. And so it does. I can only hope that while Professor Patch is watching us, she feels the love for her that is still so much part of the law school and in this room. And she's certainly smiling now to see Professor Jane Spinnick as our keynote speaker. They share an interest and fascination in so many areas of law as Professor Spinnick's scholarly work is at the intersection of family court, children, juveniles, issues of racism, classism. And I'm so very delighted to introduce to you Jane Spinnett, who is also a dear friend and mentor of mine for almost 30 years. In fact, we recently decided over drinks in Puerto Rico that we think she hired me. <laughs> pretty sure, we looked at the years, pretty sure. That was one of my most transformative and favorite jobs at Legal Aid as a juvenile rights lawyer, and more on that later. Um, Professor Spinnett has recently retired from Columbia Law, where she taught for 40 years, four decades. And in that way, she's our version of Albany Law School, Professor Nancy Moore, who also did 40 years. Um, like Nancy, Jane's dedication to clinic students and clinic clients in these four decades has been tireless. 
During a long sabbatical from Columbia, she also helped New York City families directly as the head of the Juvenile Rights Division at the Legal Aid Society in New York City. So much of that work from Columbia, so much of that work from Legal Aid is displayed in this wonderful book about an abolitionist approach to the Columbia Code. And I'm, I am sure you are too, very excited to hear her remarks this evening. I'm deeply honored to have read very early iterations and chapters of this great book, which is here. The book is passionate, insightful, clear, accessible, and thought-provoking. Just to read from her introduction, Jane writes, when I began writing this book, I had no intention of calling for the abolition of family court. Yet, contemporary investigations into this country's struggles with racism, poverty, inequality, and the separation of children from their families and communities have now solidified my belief that family court cannot simply be remade into a better version of itself. I also love the synergies of the full circle moment when I realized that on the back of the book with these impressive people who talk about the book, the very last one was our cats lecturer two years ago, Kristen Henning um, at Georgetown, author of The Rage of Innocence, How America Criminalizes Black Youth. And her comment on the back of the book, this is a compelling and important read from an advocate, ally, ally and scholar with 40 years of experience representing children and families in New York City. Her solutions for shrinking and ultimately dismantling the court draw explicitly from abolitionist theory and elevate the lessons learned from community activists most harm. In just a minute, I will hand over the mic to Professor Spinek. Um, at the end of her talk, we're gonna do something a little bit different. We had a student contest where we asked law students to um, submit some questions and then there's several that won a contest. So I will just ask some of those questions to Professor Spinnick and I have a couple of my own. Unfortunately, we're not gonna have time to take any from Zoom today or the audience, but we will have a lovely reception afterwards. For those of you on Zoom, please, grab yourself a nice cocktail or, uh, you know, cheese of your own. Uh, we wish you could be here. There's more food for us, I suppose. Um, and thank you so much for being here. I'm turning it over now to Professor James. Thank you, Professor Drager, who I usually call Melissa. Um, thank you, Dean Carlin. Um, I really appreciate your welcome. Uh, I surprisingly, Betsy, never met your mother. Um, I knew of her, but I, and I'm not quite sure how that happened, but uh, it's wonderful to be able to speak um, in a lecture that that is named after her. Um, I have many friends at Albany Law School um, and I see them in the audience and it's very nice to be with them. I also have a former student in the, in the audience, Professor Cheka, who was my student in the Child Advocacy Clinic just a couple of years ago. Um, and I also want to note that I'm on the board of the Center for Family Representation in New York City. And we have a new executive director whose name is Tara Cole, and she went to Albany Law School. So um, I feel all of these connections. Um, also, as I told almost everybody that I've met today. I grew up 50 miles northwest of here in Gloversville, New York. So um, this is home ground for me. Um, actually, this was the city um, where, you know, it was very exciting to come to. Um, and I still feel uh, very, very connected to my upstate roots. Occasionally when I uh, came on lobbying trips, I always talked to the staff about where I was from because then I wasn't just a city person. So it worked well for that as well. So I'm going to 
begin today with a story shared with me by a clinical colleague in another state. I'm going to use that story as a touchstone for understanding both today's family court and its origins in the original juvenile court movement at the beginning of the 20th century. John was a victim of bullying in his freshman year of high school. He had been diagnosed in third grade with ADHD, major depression and anxiety, and suffered from problems with his physical motor skills. John's school identified him as a student with a disability eligible for special education supports and services. In November of his freshman year, John attempted suicide after repeated bullying. A psychiatrist recommended that John receive homebound education while he was adjusting to his medication and recovering from his emotional trauma. His family expected the school administration to respond appropriately to the hostile environment before his return to school after the Christmas break. On his first morning back at school in early January, John was called to the principal's office over the public intercom. When he arrived at the office, he was confronted by a city police officer who told him he was under arrest for truancy and would be taken to the juvenile detention center. He was arrested in front of the entire school during a class break. He was placed in the back of a police car and driven to the detention center. There he was told to strip naked, ordered to shower, and given an orange jumpsuit. He was bombarded with questions about sex and drugs before being compelled to give a urine sample, which was clean. John was allowed one phone call to his mother at the end of the day. He spent the night in a locked cell where he mingled with other youth who were charged with serious offenses. The next morning, John appeared in juvenile court, still wearing the orange jumpsuit, but now handcuffed and in shackles. When his case was finally called, the judge did not allow John nor his family to speak. He was not represented by counsel. The judge told John that if he didn't go to school, he would be placed in a foster home and then ordered child welfare authorities to investigate John's family. Afraid of disobeying the court, his family took John back to school for the rest of the day. John had not committed any crime. Rather, he was arrested for what is called a status offense, misbehavior that would not be a crime if committed by an adult. When juvenile court began, the reasons that children found themselves before a judge were not divided formally into jurisdictional categories. Children could be brought to the court if they allegedly committed a crime, what we now call juvenile delinquency, if they disobeyed their parents and teachers by engaging in behavior that was not criminal, but was prohibited only because of their age, like John's alleged truancy, or having sex or drinking alcohol, or sometimes dangerous but not criminal adolescent behavior, what we now call status offenses or if their parents couldn't control them, failed or were unable to provide for them overwhelmingly because of poverty or actually hurt them, what we now call child protection or child welfare. These three categories of family regulation were not formally differentiated because the role of the court was to help the child so she would desist from troublesome behavior and her parent would provide proper care. If trouble continued, the state would take over the role of being a parent. One early judge called this being a super parent. Another called it the, being the general supervisor and mentor of the home. And another said that the judge's role was, quote, doing something for a child because of what he is and needs, 
rather than doing something to a child because of what he has done, unquote. Parents then and now are never happy when their teenagers misbehave. They worry about their children skipping school, drinking, using drugs, hanging out with the wrong kids, or just not following the rules. But when parents seek help to solve these concerns, most of them don't expect that their children will face strict conditions of probation, indiscriminate drug testing, fines, community service, threats of removal from their homes, compelled attendance in programs, or even incarceration. Their children aren't committing crimes. They are just being adolescents and they need help. What's worse, these parents have always been predominantly poor and the children and youth who wind up in court on status offenses are disproportionately poor and children of color. Whether a child becomes court involved in a status offense case today from actions of their parents or in a majority of the cases from petitions filed by school systems, law enforcement, and child welfare agencies. The fundamental question is whether the nation's juvenile and family courts are equipped meaningfully to help. We'll get to the fact that John hadn't actually done anything wrong, and then what he needed was clearly not provided. But first, let's look at what the judge felt he was free to do. Every state has created some variation of status offense jurisdiction. Once court jurisdiction is triggered, not only the youth, but also whoever brought the case to court, parent, school, police, is subject to the judge's decision of what is best, including a decision that the petitioner disagrees with. Generally, after some form of proceeding or a settlement discussion, the court has broad discretion to decide the appropriate disposition. Depending on the state, the dispositions at the court's disposal include probation, treatment, rules of behavior, placement outside of the home, and as I said, incarceration. The conflation of delinquency for both breaking the law and misbehaving continued far into the 20th century. This legacy helps to explain, if not justify, the outrageous actions by the police and John's judge. By the 1950s, some jurisdictions, including New York, were beginning to make a distinction between the two, especially with the goal of not treating what was often common adolescent behavior as criminal. Yet the dis positions often remained identical. What had the greatest impact for creating a distinction between these two kinds of behavior, criminal or not, was the Supreme Court decision in In re Galt. Gerald Galt had allegedly placed a lewd phone call. Without notice to his parents or a formal petition, Gerald was arrested and brought to court. There he was without a lawyer, without his parents, a complaining witness, or any other competent evidence. The judge sent Gerald, sentenced him to six years in the Arizona Industrial School, basically the rest of his minority. Had he been an adult, he would have gotten up to 30 days in jail or a fine. Luckily, his case was taken up by the ACLU and ultimately reached the Supreme Court, where Justice Abe Fortas outlined very clearly what was wrong, what, sorry, what was wrong with what had happened to Gerald. Justice Fortas couldn't abolish a juvenile court that existed in all 50 states, and he said so, even though he really questioned the constitutionality of the court. But he lambasted the court for neither providing benevolent help nor due process, saying, quote, unbridled discretion, however benevolently motivated, is frequently a poor substitute for principle and procedure, unquote. The decision announced a new standard for the court, funding <laughs> fairness, to take the place of unfettered discretion. 
youth charged with delinquency would have many of the same due process rights that the court was now requiring for, for adults, including a right to counsel. Justice Fortas and his colleagues were not the only ones appalled by the lawlessness of juvenile courts. President Lyndon Johnson's Commission on Law Enforcement and the Administration of Justice issued a report called The Challenge of Crime in a Free Society, in which it castigated the juvenile court for its failure to achieve any of its original goals, rehabilitating youth, reducing or stemming delinquency, or treating youth with compassion and justice. The commission was particularly concerned with the scope of the court's reach over children and urged that all but the most serious or repeated offenders be dealt with through community efforts, especially misbehaving youth. And as Justice Fortas would accomplish just three months after the report was issued, it urged regularity and due process in the court proceedings. The juvenile court experienced this one-two punch as a first round knockout. One judge compared Galt to a nuclear bomb on the court. The National Council of Juvenile Court Judges rejected the research and recommendations of the Johnson Commission and quickly passed a resolution opposing any narrowing of the court's jurisdiction. But they still had to deal with the imposition of some due process especially right to counsel. At the time that Galt was decided, between a third and a half of the juvenile court or the family court's delinquency dockets involved youth who had committed no crime, but, the, but whose so-called incorrigibility invoked state action. Relabeling misbehaving youth as status offenders kept them under the jurisdiction without requiring the same due process rights. So over the next decade, most states created in need of supervision jurisdiction, like in New York, persons in need of supervision or PINs. To keep control over these youth without declaring them delinquent and without providing them with due process rights. Yet as a California legislative report found at the time, there was not a single shred of evidence that existed that these youth were helped by court intervention and instead, quote, what evidence does exist points to the contrary, unquote. Most states also created diversion programs, sending youth to treatment or activities that the court could continue to monitor. The federal government weighed in in 1974 in a new Juvenile Justice Act, providing financial incentives to keep status offenders out of detention and incarceration with delinquent youth. While all of these solutions had a dramatic initial impact on the number of youth in court, judges overall remained adamant against any loss of authority and continued to fight back, and they started to win. First, they helped to defeat a proposal to eliminate jurisdiction over status offenses. Through most of the 1970s, the Institute of Judicial Administration at NYU and the American Bar Association worked on a set of juvenile justice standards to provide guidance to the judges who were now incorporating due process into their proceedings. 20 volumes of the standards were approved by the ABA House of Delegates. Only one volume was tabled as too controversial, the one on non-criminal misbehavior, which called for the elimination of status offenses. Public declarations and scare tactics by family court judges held sway, warning that the community supports that would supposedly substitute for court jurisdiction would never be provided, and so youth would end up with nothing. One of the directors of the Juvenile Justice Standards Project, Barbara Flicker, said that after this vast project ended, that, quote, defining the boundaries of justifiable state intervention in the lives of children and families was fundamental, and everything else was mere detail. 
The family court judges fought to keep that boundary as wide as possible. The judges also saw an opportunity to recapture some of their lost authority. The Juvenile Justice Act had come up for reauthorization in 1980. Testifying on behalf of what was now called the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, Judge, jo Judge John Milligan said this of losing lockup power over status offenders, quote, the effect of the Juvenile Justice Act is to allow a child ultimately to decide for himself whether he will go to school, whether he will live at home, whether he will continue to run, run, run away from home, or whether he will even obey the orders of your court, unquote. The National Council successfully lobbied for an amendment that would allow judges to lock up status offenders if they violated an order of the court, like not going to school or following their parents' curfew time. While not all states adopted what came to be called the Valid Court Order Exception, or VCO, many did. Fortunately, New York did not. The court was reasserting control over these youth, and they were again being locked up without due process. Yet even two decades later, at the very end of the 20th century, the National Council was still testifying in, con in Congress that taking away the court's full power to lock up misbehaving youth had stymied the court's ability to help children and families. Before we return to John, let's look at what's happened overall in the last couple of decades. At the beginning of the century, about 200,000 young people were being charged as status offenders, with close to 15,000 of them being taken out of their homes. By 2019, the numbers dipped below 100,000, with about 5,000 placed out of their homes. That is the good news. What remains a stubborn problem is that even as case rates decline, they do so less for Native American and Black youth, especially girls, disproportionately. Over half of those cases were for truancy, linking schools directly with court. While John's experience was especially traumatic and disgraceful, there are other horrific examples. In Meridian, Mississippi, the federal DOJ filed a school to prison pipeline complaint against the school, the city, the county, and even the youth court and its judges for establishing an unconstitutional system of automatically arresting children suspended from school and sending them to youth court where they were placed on probation and required to serve their school suspensions in juvenile detention. Between 2006 and 2009, all of the students referred to law enforcement under these policies were black. All of the students expelled were black and 96% of the students suspended were black. There is more news that has to be considered. When Congress reauthorized the Juvenile Justice Act in 2018, the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges finally supported repealing the VCO exception. However, the VCO was restricted, but not repealed. So judges in states that continue to use it have more hoops to jump through to lock up youth, and they can do it for less time, but they can still do it. While these restrictions will certainly continue to reduce the use of lockups and keep them out of dangerous facilities, the VCO is only the worst aspect of charging a young person with a status offense. Being charged as a status offense offender is stigmatizing, humiliating, ineffective, and punitive, a way, difficult way to address complex individual, family, and community problems. Youth are blamed by their parents, their school, or the police, and then fight these authority figures in court to challenge the allegations or try to exonerate themselves. This is very bad for families. When I said that the story about John was based on a colleague's client, there was more to it. 
This colleague and I had decided to use the story in 2015 in an op-ed piece. We were peddling to media outlets to support the elimination of the VCO exception and to recommend that the federal government go further and urge states to eliminate status offenses entirely. Not a single news agency or organization was interested. Now, it could be because it wasn't very well written, but I'm guessing that most people, including some of you and most of the media, know nothing about this particular court power and its lingering influence on the idea of the court being a problem-solving court, a court created to do good for children and families by using its discretion. My point here today is that this power, this jurisdiction, this authority, this discretion is representative of what makes family courts so unique and in my mind, so difficult to reform. I've provided some strong examples of attempts to reign in the court, even by the Supreme Court, that have never proved sufficient to curtail the discretion of judges. Even our own Family Court Act in New York says that once jurisdiction is satisfied, the court, quote, is given a wide range of powers for dealing with the complexities of family life so that its actions may fit the particular needs of those before it. The judges of the court are thus given a wide discretion and grave responsibilities." Unquote. In my book, status offenses provide one way to see how that discretion can be used in the name of doing good of using benevolence not only to treat, but to punish. But that is only one example, and sadly, there are many more in child protection and delinquency. Why do these flaws bring me to abolition rather than to reform? It's because neither the multiple reinventions of the court over the past century nor layering some procedural protections atop its hearings have diminished the interventionist spirit of such a court to save children, and if they can't be saved, to punish them and their families through extreme intrusion, surveillance, separation, or even incarceration. At the same time, the family court has neither the authority nor the inclination to confront the structural barriers that bedevil the marginalized families that appear there. It focuses, it focuses instead on the specific child, youth, or parent as the problem to be fixed, reinforcing the belief that the court, by fixing the person, will fix the larger systemic problem. An abolitionist approach, in contrast, embraces different premises about the court. The first is that a court is not the place to solve problems, but instead, and only when absolutely necessary, is the form to adjudicate disputes. The idea of a therapeutic court has blurred the distinction between actual legal controversies and the social problems that families face, like poverty, racism, and systemic marginalization that cannot be addressed by a court process. Yet massive surveillance and regulatory systems are primed to send families into court, not because there is an adversarial legal dispute, but because the court has been designated as the place to manage marginalized families and their problems. An abolitionist approach also rejects trying to improve this kind of court. The family court has been reformed, or more honestly, reinvented and readjusted repeatedly since its birth as the juvenile court. Yet those adjustments have failed to improve either the processes or the outcomes for most of the litigants and have instead caused significant harm. The family court's belief in its ability to do good has salved its conscience and prevented it from confronting the harm that even well-intentioned do-gooding has caused. 
An abolitionist mindset only allows for interim measures that are not reformist in nature, those intended to strengthen and improve the current system, but instead non-reformist reforms, those that will shrink and ultimately justify the court's demise. The mission to do good has also thwarted the court from recognizing how it has helped to drain resources out of communities and into the court or the government agencies that report to the court. By structuring responses to marginalized families around court processes that focus on blame and intervention, the grossest inequalities that propel those families into court are ignored. My colleague, Professor Kendall Thomas, once said that, quote, abolition is looking at problems from the perspective of the governed, unquote. The goal of abolishing the family court must be consonant with the experiences and agendas of those most deeply harmed. From the perspective of children and families who find themselves in family court, they want a different solution to these issues that got them there. I doubt we would even be talking about the abolition of the family court without the truth reckoning brought about by impacted youth and parents in the last decade. Embracing their voices and leadership is an integral part of the solution. I know that many of you are thinking that by eliminating the family court, these practices will just move to other judicial settings, maybe. But let me be clear, over the 40 years that I have been involved in the family court, I have met hundreds of dedicated people who work in and around the court. This is not a condemnation of their work or their dedication. It is instead a way to reimagine the history of the court and confront its future. I, as, as, Professor Breger said, I no longer believe a court originally created to save children from their own families and communities can shed its historic mandate. At multiple points during the last century, neither efforts to limit the court's discretionary reach nor attempts to overlay its problem-solving character with due process protections for children or parents have succeeded in constraining the court's fundamental belief in its power to do good, whether ther by therapeutic or punitive means. In the spring of 2020, family regulation reforms began to sweep the country. The state of New York eliminated the term incorrigible from its status offenses statute, encouraged by the Brooklyn-based Girls for Gender Equity which lobbied the legislature under the banner, incorrigible, not incorrigible. These changes are likely to reduce the harm to some youth and families, but they are essentially back-end reforms, leaving in place the structures that have regulated marginalized families for more than a hundred years. Not labeling a youth incorrigible, without eliminating status offense jurisdiction altogether, fails to address why truant, runaway, or other misbehaving youth who haven't broken the law are still being brought to court. And why so many others who, so many others of us who have the financial ability to provide what their children need or to hide their children's misbehavior from government authorities do not find themselves in family court. An abolitionist mindset require, requires us to let go of those historical beliefs. Each time proposals to move significant authority out of the court have been proposed, judges have warned of the dangers to families of diminishing judicial power. When various reformists and policymakers recommend replacing judicial authority and jurisdiction, especially with the development of community-based voluntary, voluntary and comprehensive supports, family court judges have obstinately responded with, we may not always get it right and we may do some harm, but we're better than the alternative. 
Just last week, a friend of mine who is a family court judge said the punitiveness of our country is never going to allow for the kinds of changes I propose, nor is the government going to fund them. Nevertheless, I'm persisting in my recommendations. My book contains very concrete steps to limit who is brought to court, what jurisdictional authority the court should have, and what due process means for those who are now in a court of law and not a social court. It then offers ways to consider how best to support all families and prevent and create preventive mechanisms for targeted needs. The long-term goal of my recommendations is what Professor Nancy Dowd has called a new deal for children. For children to be equal, to be treated equally, and to have an equal chance, we have to accept the reality that children have always been and still are unequal. If children are going to have the opportunity to develop equally, parents and children must be liberated to fully engage in that transformation. And we must develop a radical imagination to understand that no institution having control over families is sacred, including the family court. Thank you. I'm going to be proud of your questions. Okay. Yes. Um, well, thank you very much for that. Um, lots of lots of things to talk about. Fascinating, pondering things to think of. And so, some of these questions, perhaps you've already answered. Um, I'll ask you a couple, and then I'll tell you the student questions. Um, so how are the procedures and policies of modern family court intertwined with racism, classism, and xenophobia? Well, I, I touched on that a little, and um, as, as you said, and as I said, I hadn't intended uh, to be an abolitionist when I began this. Um, I really did think uh, family court could be reformed. And then I went down the rabbit hole of the history of the court. And it was, I mean, I knew a little of it, um, but I did not realize how persistent the efforts were to reform the court from the very beginning. And that what the... So two things. One is the court began in the cities of the Northeast and the Midwest at the beginning of the 20th century when the immigration was flooding these cities. These were predominantly poor and um, immigrants, you know, by the millions, they were coming from Eastern and Southern Europe look different than the earlier white settlers. They had different customs and language. Um, and there was a development of the idea of, well, how are we going to turn this immigrant population into, quote, proper Americans? And the juvenile court was a piece of that. This was one part of their goal um, to, quote, fix these families. <laughs> The court did not reach the South immediately. And at, as it did in the first decades of the 20th century, and as Black families moved North, um, they came disproportionately into the court. And what amazed me was not that that had happened, um, but that it was recognized sometimes by the court system itself, and often by two good groups in the community, whether they were black clubs or, or white clubs or these reformist clubs, they were, they were watching what was happening in court and saying right from the beginning, why are we bringing 
black children disproportionately into the poor. Why are we not providing services to the most, the poorest people who are in the poor, who are disproportionately people of color? And they began to study really what was going on in the communities where the poorest and 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 as this migration came north, predominantly black community. And in 1910, in 1920, in 1930, the reports all said the same thing. These families are segregated. They are poor. They are not getting the same schools. They're not getting the same health care. They're not get, getting the same supports. They don't have the same employment opportunities. Okay, that's exactly what we're saying today. And it got said over and over again throughout the century. It never stopped. In New York, as many of you know, just a couple of years ago, there was a new report, two old reports about the family court and what it said. It's a racist institution. We bring disproportionately children of color, families of color into this court, and then they get disparate treatment. That's what they said in 1914 and in 1924 and in 1937. And so given that that's all the history, it, was, it is clear to me that without stepping back and thinking very differently about where, where we want people to get help um, and recognizing that this court has never had either the capability or the incentive to solve those problems. So, yet it remains a place where people think those problems have been. So people might be wondering, what are the concrete steps you talk about in your book to actually shrink and then abolish? There's a list. <laughs> and I'll tell you a story about the list, which is that, um, Nancy, professor Nancy Dowd, um, who is an eminent professor in uh, family law and is the series editor of uh, the series that my book was published. And so when she read the last chapter of the book, which was about abolition, the first half of it is these concrete recommendations. And the second half is, is a broader discussion about how um, the court has gotten in the way, one of the institutions that has gotten in the way of court equality and the ability of families to participate fully in, in our democracy. But when she got to the first half, she said, oh, you know what you have to do? You have to make a list. You have to put this list right at the end of that first half. And, and so everybody's reminded of, of what exactly you think needs to be done. And, and actually a friend of mine who teaches at the University of Tennessee, when she saw the list, she went and made a copy and put it up on her board. So obviously eliminating status offenses uh, was very important to me. I never had a client charged with a status offense that anybody believed could be held by the court. And I never had a judge who thought I could help them. So why they want to hold on to this, I don't know. And then I have recommendations around the, the juvenile legal system and about and around what I now call family regulation system. Some people call it the family policing system. The public calls it the child welfare system. Um, so I'll, I could talk about a couple of that. In the juvenile legal system, um, one of the, the core recommendations is that the age of juvenile responsibility should be raised to 14, which is the international standard for juvenile responsibility. There are states in this country 
that have no lower age. So six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old get arrested um, and brought to court. You know, what, what could they possibly gain from that? Um, New York finally raised it to 12. Okay, that's not bad, but but still, how much how much can a 12 year old understand? What do they really need? They need all kinds of assistance, but probably not the court assistance. Um, I think that some of the crimes that young people are charged with are really about misbehavior, even though they're, they're not status offenses. And that we should really rethink, it, is this really what we want to bring young people into court for, for trespass, for fights in school, for, you know, there's a whole range of things that are not serious. And that, you know, you want to address, but but not through a court system. And then I would say the last thing um, in that area that's most important to, to recognize is that the young people who are brought to court um, need the full due process rights um, that are supposed to be available. So we're a little spoiled in New York, especially in New York City, where there is there is quite rigorous um, representation by counsel for both children and parents. Um, but many of the Department of Justice investigations during the Obama administration found throughout the country, children were not getting lawyers, there were not due process hearings, um, and it looked a lot like it did when Gerald Galt um, ended up being being sent to a reform school for six years. Um, so I do think that the availability of due process rights and especially of lawyers is key. Um, I also agree with uh, another colleague who, who um, is a specialist on the juvenile legal system, which is to say, in fact, children need more rights than adults. They need rights from the moment of arrest. Many, many uh, police departments never call parents before children are spoken to. Um, they try to get stuff out of kids, and you know what? It's not so hard to get stuff out of kids, even kids who think they're tough. Um, having having represented them, you know, and you can say to them, "Don't talk, don't talk." But it's hard when you're not in the room for them not to talk. So um, I do think that that they need more due process protections um, than you. So let me talk just for a couple minutes about um, the child protection system. Um, Professor Cheka has written one of the most important articles about mandated reporting and voluntary and, and um, anonymous reporting. Um, what has happened in this country is that people think by picking up the phone, and calling the abuse and neglect hotline, they're helping people. They are not helping people. Um, at last count, 8 million calls were made about 3 million children. 80% of those calls were, were either screened out initially, screened out after an investigation, even screened out when they got to court. So, so we're investigating millions of families every year without actually helping them. Half of the children in this country by the time they turn 18 will have had a report and I'm sorry, a third of all children and half of all black children, more than half actually, of all black children. And most of those reports do not result in families getting any services. 
So we created this system. In 1990, the Federal U.S. Advisory Board on Neglect and Abuse said, in 1990, this is a terrible system. We need to stop it. We need to figure out how to support families raising their children, not report them. And yet this system has grown and grown and grown. Um, so certainly, so, so let me say one thing about mandated reporting, which is that those are all the helpers in people's lives, whether they're teachers or doctors or the child care or the dentist, they're all mandated reporters. So what does that mean? What that means is they think if they know anything, they're just supposed to pick up the phone and call. What they don't realize is that that what they're supposed to do is try to figure out for what does this family need? You know, is this really something that has to be reported or is this linked to their poverty, linked to their lack of housing, linked to, you know, lack of food? Um, so what happens is that, that parents are afraid to go for help. They're afraid to speak to the teacher. They're afraid to speak to the guidance counselor. They're afraid to go to the doctor because in their communities, going to the doctor can quickly lead to a report. This doesn't mean that those professionals should never report about what they see as, as real concern about the safety of the child. But if they're mandated to do it and they face liability for not doing it, they just do it. They don't stop and ask, is this really something that needs to be reported? Or can I connect this family to some help? So, so you know, that's a big one. Um, Another big one is changing the definition of neglect and abuse. The those juvenile justice standards project, um, while while the non-criminal misbehavior was the only one able, they dragged out the abuse and neglect volume for so long that the project ended. And why did they do that? Because they the judges spoke forcefully to the ABA against narrowing their jurisdiction over him. So we have under federal law a very broad definition of what constitutes neglect or abuse, and which which if 80% of those cases are are screened out at some point. We know what they're about. They're really about poverty and inequality and, and families not being able to access what they need, including treatment, right? Okay, uh, a mother may need substance use treatment. A father may need mental health treatment, but they don't necessarily need to go to court to get it. They, they need it readily available in their communities. Um, so narrowing that definition um, to serious harm or risk of serious harm, serious yeah. neglect or risk of serious neglect, like real starvation or, you know, real harm, physical harm or, or the lack of essential medical treatment for something serious going on medically. That's what was recommended in the ABA standards all those years ago. That standard has been recommended over and over again. And yet we, we continue to have this very broad standard that undermines not just all those standards that are local, but it also undermines the families that do need some intervention. Because if you're spending all your time on, on stuff that doesn't belong there, you're not spending your time on serious cases. 
that need some form of legal adjudication and clearly need some intervention, whatever that might be. But those cases don't get the attention that they should because we're spending so much time on, on the stuff that is. Um, one more and then I'll stop. Um, I have others. Uh, you can read the book and see, or you can just open it to that page and see. <laughs> um, it's really important um, for anyone who is brought to this court to have representation. The only thing that's going to um, fight within the court is due process. And it's very hard to get due process when we don't have um, and so I know some of the questions are going to be about that, so I won't say more. Um, but those are those are some of the very concrete things that I'm that that I argue and give more to. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, we had a student contest where students were asked to submit questions to Professor Spinnett um, and the top three, well, the top uh, person got a signed book and the other ones are invited to breakfast tomorrow. So let me read you. And I'll sign your book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she'll sign them today too at the reception. <laughs> the table, so. Um, so this is a combined question from Rebecca Carson um, and Ashlyn Hendricks. I kind of combined them because they have some similarities. Um, your book discusses how the family court's pursuit of benefiting families have actually impacted families in negative ways based upon such things as race and economic situations. Is there anything family law attorneys or judges can do now to help address those issues in the modern day family court? And are there ways that all attorneys, regardless of specialty, could be helping in your mission and working on strategy? Well, you know, I started to talk about due process. It really is amazing what happens when um, you have representation. So for lawyers who are working within the court, the first thing is your obligation to your client, and that is to do the best work possible and to keep your standards very high and to not think you know best um, which children's lawyers sometimes think. You have to represent your client's legal interests, not what you might think are their best interests. And all of that will require the court to hold itself to a different standard. And I would say that, that what has happened in New York City um, can really... Um, really provides a guideline for what's possible to happen in the rest of the country and is starting to happen in jurisdictions, which is a kind of holistic representation where uh, you're not just represented by a lawyer, you're represented by a lawyer who works with a social work professional and a peer professional. So for young people, that means someone who has gone through the system, knows what it's like, and is now hired to help young people understand what's going on when they're, when they're involved in these cases. And the same thing for parents. Um, parents with lived experience um, working in family defense offices have had, I would say, the biggest impact on the quality of the representation that the parents are getting because they're trusted. Once they're trusted, then the parent trusts the other people, meaning the social worker and the lawyer that they might not have trusted because they just saw them as part of the system. So it's a different approach while while the lawyer's arguing stuff in court, the social worker and the parent advocate are figuring out with the parent, what do they need? What, what's available in their community? What can they do before it 
ever gets to, to a fact-finding hearing in court that might result in dismissal before, before it even gets there because the parent advocate and the social worker have connected the parent to what they need. Um, so I think that doing the best lawyering and the best kind of lawyering is, is the first step. I think the second is to really, and maybe this is the best lawyering, is, is to take the concept of client-centered lawyering seriously. That is, your client is the expert of their lives. You are not. And if you don't spend the time finding out what got this family to where it is, whether it's a child client or an adult client, you are not, you are not helping this parent or this child to get where it is they want to be. Um, they have solutions. So when I started practicing, I never thought about my clients having solutions. Um, that's me. That's that's what I'm ashamed of from what I started doing 40 years, more than 40 years ago. You live and learn. You get better. And you come to understand that you are partnering with your client to find the answer. And so it's important to start that right at the beginning. Um, I would also say that, I'm, you know, I think the challenge is often that you are your first focus always must be on that responsibility. So how do you do that when at the same time you're looking at the larger system and saying, well, this is a mess. So you have to figure out where's your place in fixing that mess. Is it lobbying? Is it is it drafting legislation? Is it taking policy stands? Is it going down and doing know your rights to communities? Is it letting your community leaders know what's wrong with the system that you're working within? Um, it's it's keeping up on, on, you know, all that's wrong in the way that our legal system works and figuring out, you know, what small step can you take? And sometimes it's as a lawyer, and sometimes it's that you, you know, you go and you coach a moot court in a high school that doesn't have a lot of resources. Um, or you meet with a group of young people that it's the same community they're coming out of and, and help them connect to things that they really want to do. So there's, you know, the, you have to do some things with your lawyer woke on, and then you have to do some things where, where you, you're just recognizing that you're making a difference um, by by helping the communities that that you are that you see your clients are here. Okay. I believe that helps. Um, so I'm going to ask one last question, also from a student. I don't think I see her today, but um, Stephanie Kozowski. and she asks: With the inequities that we see with the whole legal system, including Supreme Court and criminal court. Why target only family court for abolition? Court, I know. Um, so, make no mistake. I, I think our court system is is not in good shape. Uh, so, I think that a couple of one is it is the system I need, and it's a specialized system. It's this system that was started with the notion that it could be good. Criminal court judges don't sit there and say, I'm doing good every day. Um, even civil court judges don't sit there. They, the best of them say, I'm trying to be fair. I'm listening to both sides. I'm, I'm having a high standard of evidence. 
I'm, I'm, I'm doing all that my judicial ethics require me to do. That helps. The family court judge has this little extra thing. I mean, I read to you the part of the section of the Family Court Act where if they can make sense to them, figure it out, do something, be, do something about the best interests of this family or these children. And they can. I, I you know, I mean, I don't blame them. Um, it's but but the best judges in family court don't do that. What they do is they hold themselves to that standard of what my obligation is, is to listen and to, and to, to act within the law and to, to provide to every litigant all of what they are doing. I, I'm not having these little colloquies about what's best. I'm not letting hearsay come in constantly i'm right so but they feel that they have this little extra i don't know what you call it um maybe, yeah maybe you know uh <laughs> yeah crown i mean you know uh one of the reports of the new york children's court in the 1950s said the judge see him or herself as the monitor, and so do all the people who come into the court. Um, so I think that it is especially important because of the families that this court impacts. That that um, you we absolutely will have to have some proceedings. They can be in a part of the criminal court that takes special notice that children are children and not adults. We have to treat them differently. You don't need a whole court for that. And a part of the civil court that that also um, somebody tra is trained to understand these particular cases, but not with that added ability to decide what. Um, with much clearer direction and laws about the limits of their powers. Um, uh, so that's why this court, I think, is different. On the other hand, I, you know, I want to say it's, yes, it's called the end of family court, but the purpose of this court really is to say we have to stop treating those people in our society who are marginalized, those people in our society of color who, who, are, who are shepherded through this court that does no good. And what we have to do instead is create a society that values everyone and that takes all this money, that, that takes children out of their homes Fifteen billion last year went just for out of home care. You take fifteen billion and spread it around communities. I don't think you're going to have so many things being brought to court. So that's that really is my goal, um, and to allow then um, those families to to use this greater access to what we all need participate more fully in our democracy because it's really hard to do that when you are constantly being called into various courts for not doing anything wrong so on that note <laughs> uh, there's been so much food for thought. There's so much for us to keep talking about. I wish we could hope. And in fact, we do have that opportunity. I wish our folks on Zoom could join us. But for those of us in the room, we will now go to the foyer where we'll have food and drink and we'll take some photos and find some books. Um, I do want to give one last plug. 
Professor Lynch always says that the Kate Stoneman Day is the sister event to the Cat Stoneman, the Kate, the Cats event. So I wanted to let you know we have a date. It's March 27th, 2024. We're going to be honoring Verna Williams from Equal Justice. Um, and you're invited to come. Um, and I want to thank everybody for being here, for joining us, and for listening to this incredible talk today.